I grew up Catholic and attended Catholic schools, and I've heard a lot about purity and chastity. I've started seriously dating a man, and we've been dating for nearly half a year, having known each other as friends beforehand. Before this relationship, I never thought that the issue of chastity would be a problem for me. (laughs) Naively, of course. (laughs) There must be something going on here. Now that I'm in this relationship, I'm wondering how I can balance desiring intimacy with my partner in the context of dating without adopting a mentality of how far can we go before it is, quote, wrong, end quote. Yeah. Because naturally that leaves us both wanting more, but still feeling like we've taken things too far. Well, Caroline, thank you for the honest question. And when I kind of made that comment, ah, oh, sounds like something's going on here. I, I meant that in a, in a positive way. <laughs> uh, I would say if, if you didn't have a challenge in chastity, then there's something maybe, I don't know, something you're out of touch with in your own heart. Mm. Like Eros is a beautifully uh, human experience. And the wrestling with Eros that is part and parcel of learning to love another person is just that, part and parcel of learning to love another person. And we all have to go through that struggle. Whatever you're calling in life, whether you're called to marriage or called to a celibate vocation, wrestling with chastity, and by that I mean learning to orient Eros towards the truth of loving, is mm-hmm. something we all have to go through. Yeah. And I just, I don't find it credible when people say, I've, I've never struggled with that, or mm-hmm. I don't struggle with that. Uh, are you, are you, what? Are, are you learning to love? Are you alive inside? Are mm. you, are you, put it this way, chastity is not about canceling our passions, canceling our desires, right. erasing them. It's about directing them towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. And in this fallen world, that's going to be a struggle for all of us. I remember, Wendy, when you and I were engaged, so a little bit of a different stage of relationship than, than this couple. But I remember I got to a point where I was so concerned that we were going to go too far in our affections that I started putting up a wall between us. And I was like, just, I saw myself, and I remember you remember this too, just we were distancing ourselves from each other because we were afraid of how attracted we were to one another, and we're so attracted we're going to choose wrongly and screw it up, and Mm. I don't want to do that, so wall. Mm. And I remember realizing when I saw myself putting up a wall towards you, I remember thinking, wait a minute, do I think that if the wall were to come, do I think I really need a wall between us to protect us from unchastity? Do I really think that if I let the wall down that you would consciously choose something for me that was not good? Do I not trust you to, to honor me and, and love me in the right way? Uh, and can I trust myself to want to honor you and love you in the right way? And I remember having a talk with you about this and saying, apologizing to you, because you were feeling the distance mm-hmm. that I was putting, placing between us. And I said, Wendy, I trust you. I, I trust you to choose my good. And I want to prove myself to you as trustworthy in choosing your good. And I remember us making the conscious decision to to take that wall down and trust each other to choose what is good. And that demanded a lot of communication. That demanded a lot of open conversation. Um, But it really, and we didn't, let me just say this clearly also, there were times when we realize, oops, we, we crossed boundaries. And I regretted that we crossed some boundaries, but I knew we were both very sincere in desiring each other's true good. And we learned from those boundary crossings, okay, that's a boundary, and I remember when we crossed it and how we crossed it, so now we've learned. That, to me, was much more human in experience and genuine and sincere in experience in learning to wrestle in directing our passions rightly towards each other 
than wall. And the real danger in that mentality of put the wall up is, well, what does the wedding night become? Oh, now we're allowed to let the wall come down and just go with our passions, even if they're disordered. No, no, no. Marriage is not some legitimate opportunity to indulge your disordered passions. The, the journey of chastity, the journey of purity, the journey of directing erotic passion towards the true, the good, and the beautiful is lifelong. And the Catechism says this, the self-mastery required of chastity can never be considered gained once and for all. It demands renewed effort at every stage mm -hmm. of life. That's a paraphrase, but it's, it's the very point the Catechism makes. Mm -hmm. And certainly you and I, we've been married for almost 28 years. Um, we know that's a lifelong yeah. journey. And I, I really strongly resist this mentality. We even say things like, you need to be chased until you get married. Yeah. Wrong, wrong. You need to be chased your whole life. Mm. Uh, there's so many things wrong with that statement. Uh, first thing is, chastity isn't something you give up once you get married. Second thing is, chastity is not merely abstinence, right? Chastity is the directing of all of our erotic passions, yearnings, desires towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. There are different expressions of chastity, whether you're married or unmarried, but it's always the same principle, directing my erotic longings towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. And something I think is so helpful in Theology of the Body also is when Pope John Paul II talks about the language of the body, the prophetism of the body, the spirit. Speaking. Can you unpa unpack the yeah. prophetism more? Prophetism meaning a prophet means one that speaks the truth and the that our bodies and their complementary complementarity as male and female have the potential to speak the truth of God's self-giving love. <laughs> and I think if we take that in the, the language of the body that desire to speak the truth with our bodies can be such an orienting, yes. not just in our thoughts, but in our hearts. It can orient us in how we Amen. express affection as a couple. And because we can start to recognize the full gift of the body or the two bodies is an expression of the total gift of wedding vows, a sacramental gift. And we don't want to lie yes, yes. by choosing that expression when it's not truthful, when we aren't married people. We, if we let that sink in, and I think maybe part of, of what our questioner is saying is like, yeah, I thought I did let that sink in, so now mm -hmm. why am I like, oh, how do I actually do this in my relationship? But So it's it's going to a deeper level. Level you, you can't know how that needs to sink in until you come up against the challenge of the relationship itself. So that's not a sign that anything went wrong in your taking in of that truth. It's an it's a it's a opportunity to apply that truth to your relationship. So many couples now in our world have no experience, like zero, as in from their first date, they have been lying to one another yes, in this yes. expression and many others, you know, with their bodies. So they have no experience of respecting the meaning God has given our bodies and their ability to be united. They no experience of that. And for couples like that, when they hear of, something like natural family planning, an expression of chastity in marriage, a, an aspect of it. They think, well, but I, we love each other. You're going to like not let us show our yeah, love yeah. because they don't even recognize that the self-mastery and the freedom that we can develop through a relationship like our questioner is in, it allows us to express love in our bodies in self-mastery, in deep respect for the other, in learning our limits, in learning how to be restrained for the sake of a good that we await. And 
kind of a joyful anticipation of that rather than a resentful, as you were talking about with that wall, a resentful yes, that's yes. withheld and I'm bummed. No, we don't have to. Ex- I mean, we may experience that, but we can also experience other things through that transforming power of grace. And I do not think that any couple, no matter how much they've learned theology of the body concepts, they can you cannot live this without the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You have to call upon the Holy Spirit to deepen graces in your heart that enable you to be the person that can love that other person in a way that's truthful to your relationship. And that's what we want to do. Amen. You know, earlier I was, on the answer to the last question, I was talking about having these experiences doing this podcast with you where I I see what pours out of your heart and Mm -hmm. I think, how blessed is the person who gets gets to be married to you? I'm having that experience right now. That I'm I'm so blessed to be married to a woman who desires this. Mm. Um, Thank you, Wendy, for desiring this. You're Mm -hmm. you're desiring my good. And it, it dawned on me as you were talking that this resentment we can have towards chastity. And, and John Paul II speaks of this very insightfully in his book, Love and Responsibility, that we can have this resentment towards chastity. And the resentment really comes, he says, from sloth. Oh, yeah. Sloth is the vice that is sad because the good is difficult. Mm. Choosing the true, the good, and the beautiful is difficult for us as fallen human beings. So we can resent that it's difficult. And that sadness or resentment is is really sloth. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's out there and you're struggling with chastity and you're resenting it, Mm -hmm. or you find yourself saying, who's the church to say rah, 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 (laughs) rah? Pray against the vice of sloth. Mm -hmm. And pray to see the splendor of the dignity of the human person. John Paul II is so clear on this, and when he uses the word splendor, he means the, the radiating goodness of, yeah. of the human being, the, the beauty that flows from the dignity of a human being. As, as we glimpse it, as we come to see the true value and dignity of a human being, we don't want to violate it. We want to honor it. We want to uphold that dignity of the person. Chastity, in its true understanding, can only be motivated by that. So back to Caroline's question. She said, uh, how can I resist this um, understanding or approach to chastity of just uh, just when do we cross the limits or how far is too mm-hmm. far? If you find yourself asking the question, how far is too far, your, your heart has, has already shifted towards a legalism. Mm-hmm. And chastity is not about legalism. It's not about just following some arbitrary rules. Mm -hmm. Chastity is about the liberty to love, right? We talk a lot about sexual liberation in this culture or sexual freedom. Mm -hmm. But what does the culture mean by that? The culture means do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. Mm -hmm. The culture means indulge your compulsions without ever saying no. Is that freedom? No, don't take a deeper look. That's slavery. And if we're in that position of of a kind of enslavement to our passions, it's within that that we start thinking, well, how far is too far? I want to do this, but there's this law that tells me I can't. And then we resent the law. We have a wrong understanding of true sexual freedom, which is not the liberty to indulge my compulsions. Rather, It is liberation from the compulsion to indulge. Mm -hmm. That's self-mastery. I am master of my desires. I am master of my erotic passions. And I'm motivated in mastering them precisely because I see the value and dignity of the other. And in seeing it, I want to uphold it. I want to honor it. Mm -hmm. That's the motivation to gain self-mastery. It's like the discipline of a musician who wants to gain mastery of his motor control so he can play the piano and make beautiful music. He's heard that beautiful music and he says, I want to make music that beautiful. That's going to take discipline. That's going to take sacrifice. But that's a constructive sacrifice. That's a constructive discipline. It's always, you're speaking of construction, you're always building towards a freer, deeper honoring 
of the, the other's goodness. So I would say to Caroline, pray to see the true dignity of this person you love, and you will want to honor it. You will want to sacrifice to honor it. 